Hello, everyone. I'm Henry McKembe, CEO at Do Big Things, and welcome to Do Big Talks, where we discuss the latest trends in advocacy, ads, and technology. On today's episode, we'll be reflecting on what we learned from 2020, how we grew, and how we're preparing for victory in 2022. I'm joined by our senior content director, Janani Srinivasan, who will be giving us some insight into how we navigated the pandemic, Trump, disinformation, and much more. Uh, welcome, Jenny. Why don't you start by telling us a little bit about yourself and what you do at DBT? Hi, I'm uh, Janani. I'm a senior content director at DBT. I've worked with political campaigns and nonprofits on issues ranging from women and voting to native leadership. And uh, my proudest moment at DBT moments probably include helping elect and reelect Lauren Underwood to Congress. Uh, before DBT, I did improv and sketch comedy and short filmmaking and uh, made two films that screened in festivals, including one about a killer Christmas tree. Um, that is awesome. So there's definitely an intersection between entertainment, politics, and advocacy that I want us to revisit on another episode of the Big Talks. And I think your background would be great for that. But on today, I wanna to focus on 2020. Can you take a step back and give us a little bit of an overview of some of the challenges that we faced in 2020? Absolutely. I'll start by saying that um, I never want to think about 2020 ever again. I'm sure many of us share that sentiment, but we must. Um, to come out stronger for it and effective next year, we have to reflect on what it taught us. It was a really a watershed for our country in terms of the complexity of the issues we faced, the narratives we had to put out there, um, the competing needs and um, critical decisions that were all you know, on the table, the stakes for our democracy. Um, we must think about it. And while it was exhausting, it was, I, I, know, I know that I and many others on the team came away with um, many lessons. Uh, the first and probably primary lesson that I came away from um, 2020 with was about the importance of staying on message and refining message in the face of an incredible temptation to just become hyper-reactive and respond to whatever is happening in the news. This applies to the pandemic, this applies to whatever Trump was doing in the news. It um, actually really comprised a really good stress test for both a message and a mission uh, for an organization as a whole. Such high stakes can help sharpen and show or show you ways that your message is not ambitious or encompassing enough um, and how you might have to um, refine it. The fact is the pandemic posed incredibly tough questions as people lost their lives, their health, their housing, their jobs, their security, their savings schooling for their children. They lost their confidence and many of them um, lost their lives. As I said, millions of people were in survival mode. So we had to ask why should ordinary people under extraordinary stress listen to or care about what we're doing you know, with digital campaigns. And my conclusion that I arrived at is if a cause, if a mission truly matters, if it is truly plugged into the fundamental issues of our society, if it is truly about making people's lives better, it will be able to survive a pandemic, an asteroid, the return of the dinosaurs, whatever it may be. Again, I think this is almost like, it became a valuable test for you know uh, whether a message matters. And some examples so, of, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I was gonna say, let's go ahead. Can we talk a little bit about some examples of, of organization and content that survived that stress test? Sure. Um, I can think of three examples. Um, right off the top of my head that uh, really struck me. Um, we work with Paid Leave US, um, which is working to secure paid leave in the United States by 2022. Um, you know, you might you may think of that as, you know, a nice issue, maybe not a life or death issue. However, when COVID burst on the scene and COVID began to be, uh, uh, sorry, uh, paid leave began to be part of the conversations about the relief bills, uh, paid leave actually, um, made leaps and bounds in terms of getting that issue out in front of people. A paid leave was top of mind because, you know, so many um, parents had kids staying home from school. So many people were sick. Um, so many people weren't going to work. Um, so that issue really became critical and central and I think really proved that it is a fundamental issue of our society. Um, another org that we work with, uh, Represent Justice, um, tells the stories of people who are impacted by incarceration. And sure enough, COVID was ripping through prisons, affecting people in those settings. And, you know, Represent Justice raised, you know, 
um, a ton of money, you know, to give masks to people in prison and, you know, to to make their lives better, even in some small way, you know, when that's when in that situation. I think that message endured. Finally, we worked on the 50th anniversary of Earth Day, which was initially envisioned as a worldwide, you know, series of live events. Um, about a month before Earth Day, which is, you know, is April 22nd, everything fell apart and had to be re-envisioned as an all digital 24 hour action kind of thing. And once again, we had to consider with the COVID ripping around the world, um, ripping through countries around the world, um, <laughs> is anyone gonna care about Earth Day? The answer is yes, because just because of COVID, the climate crisis has not stopped. Um, it's still going. And so how we ended up reframing it is that these are twin crises facing humanity. They both need work. They both need us to step up. They both need solutions um, from all of us. So those were just a couple of cases in which, you know, I recall, you know, clients and organizations we work with needing to consider how do we, uh, <laughs> how do we handle this huge um, curveball that's been handed to us? And I think they proved their worth all of them. Thank you for for expanding on those. One of the things that was obviously came up is is you know having to digitize everything. You mentioned Earth Day, um, you know, moving from being in person events around the world to being um, a digital event. What tools um, help you keep the client on message and 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 continue to um, advocate as the pandemic is raging through? Do you have any that come and will play into twenty twenty two? Surprisingly, for most of the clients business. I worked on, I think it was still kind of the standard tools that we um, used, email, social, and ads, SMS. Um, you know, we ended up repurposing them to get out messages about, you know, I recall on one Senate campaign we worked on, Amy McGrath's Senate campaign, they devoted a large part of one month to simply fundraising for food banks, you know, in Kentucky. Um, I think every messaging avenue that we used had to acknowledge what was going on. It, you know, maybe soften the message from chip in right now to chip in whatever you can if you're feeling like it and have the strength. So um, per, in my personal experience, there, there wasn't a huge um, pivot in the kinds of tools that we used, but certainly for 2022, we'll be uh, thinking about it because things will have changed. Um, I know the advent of TikTok um, has got me trying to persuade all of our clients to get on TikTok. So. <laughs> Fair enough. Now you talk about simple pivots and messaging in terms of, you know, instead of chip right now, chip or whatever you can, how did you go about working with client to make that pivot and how did client respond since this was kind of new to them? I think they were receptive because uh, 2020 was basically a giant W2EF, you know, for everybody um, in terms of what they were trying to do. I will note that one kind of helpful thing about the pandemic and the election going hand in hand is that the problem and the solution went hand in hand. Um, if the pandemic shone light on all these problems in our society, the election offered a very obvious solution, which is to eject the idiots who are responsible for it and for making it worse. But I will say, you know, in response, um, I think campaigns were quite eager <laughs> for advice on how to handle all of these things. I have this joke that last year we all became in addition to emailers and advertisers, we became therapists, we became fact checkers, we became rabbis, we became apocalypse whisperers, we became guides through the wilderness. Um, there was a widespread joke on Twitter and beyond that 2020 was the worst disaster movie screenplay ever written. On top of that, authoritarian chaos is numbing <laughs> and exhausting. And so clients were like, uh, what do we do? We, we thought we handled this one thing about mail-in voting, but now there's this thing about election fraud. You know, what do we do? <laughs> so really, I think everybody on the team had to step up their game in terms of both um, being ready to respond to lies. Not sure if I've ever written content in an environment that was so full of lies and disinformation. So I think proactively getting out ahead of that um, to lists and to supporters being like, you know, not just, you know, chip in, go vote, throw in your ballot and you're good. You are being lied to, lies are all around you. Those were things that we had to frame. Um, sabotage is all around you. Trump has destroyed the post office. So after this date, don't bother mailing it, go get in line. Um, RBG died <laughs> at the worst possible moment. And I know that for one client, the majority, which is a women's voting organization, um, <laughs> everybody was devastated. The country was devastated. 
Um, so we really had to frame events like that in terms of like, RBG wouldn't want you sitting at home on your butt crying about this. She'd want you to get out there, vote, get other people to vote and fix this. Um, we, did, um, we did have to do a lot of thinking together about how to frame November 3rd and afterward, the red mirage of you know, GOP votes that was gradually then shipped away for several days. Uh, we had to actively remind people that election results would not be final on the third and that this was okay. This meant that our democracy was working. And then finally, um, I forgot the role of motivational speaker. You know, last year was again a year, the likes of which I hope to never see again, though we'll probably see it as soon as 18 months from now. Um, we had to tell people why voting mattered like at all. You know, as I said, people lost their jobs, their homes, family members, and so we were on supermajority um, uh, PAC particularly, we worked with um, polling and focus group messaging that showed that people responded to messages about how Americans have always voted, you know, through wars, through depression, through another pandemic, Americans turned out and voted. And that this is what we do, this is who we are. You know, we had to help show a way through the darkness and sure enough, 160 million people voted. So to tie that all up, I would just say in 2020, I feel that not only did we have to fill all of these different roles far beyond chip in, take this survey, attend this event, <laughs> we had to be really active. We had to become really active, emotionally intelligent storytellers. Um, from a screenwriting perspective, coming back to that, I think we had to level up from me writing a heartfelt indie to writing Rocky or the Avengers or Lord of the Rings or something like that. I think that's a skill that we'll have to, to keep the art of delineating good from evil you know? So those are some of the that's, challenges that we navigated. That's interesting um, in terms of that. So I think the pivot I want to make is we've learned this lesson from 2020. What do we take into 2022 to make sure that we're better set up to handle adversity? What are some of the things that you don't think will, will ever change and that we need to build on moving forward? Mm -hmm. Well, my answer to this would be pretty broad. I think that, you know, we know in 22, we're gonna face um, fallout of COVID. COVID will be on the ballot in many, many states, depending on how the governors and leaders handled it. We'll be, we're facing, I think at this point, 350 voter suppression bills across the country. Um, there'll be many more like Marjorie Taylor Greene running for office. Um, the Republicans are bent, hell bent on taking back at least one of the houses of Congress. So I think that actually go knowing the scope of what we're going up against um, can help us prepare. And I think it can help us uh, stress test messages even before we go in. I forgot the Oath Keepers and militias too. There's another you know, fun, fun uh, uh, wrench in the box there. So I think that if you're going into 2022 with an issue, say, you know, paid leave, you know, whatever. I think that um, knowing that you're going to be voicing that message in the middle of all of those other antagonistic messages is helpful and I think worth planning for now. If you are uh, helping a candidate who might be running against, say, a QAnon opponent, I think it's worth starting to think now about how you're going to respond to lies and uh, smears and disinformation that has no basis in fact. Um, I think preparing again to assume all of those roles that we played in 2022 is worthwhile. We really don't know what's coming in terms of voting. Are Republicans going to make people walk on their hands across burning coals blindfolded to mail in their ballots? Possibly. I feel like that's not off the table. So I think being prepared for all of that is worthwhile. Um, and then finally, um, thinking about one last thing that really helped in 2022, uh, 2020, um, we were a part of uh, Amy McGrath's PAC uh, effort to help win the Georgia runoff. We helped fundraise for that. And as we all know, we Democrats won the Georgia runoff without Facebook ads and you know, without many of the normal tools that are in the toolbox. What ended up winning the Georgia runoff was the activation and mobilization of brown and black communities across the state, which her PAC did fundraise for, including Mi Gente and Black PAC and so on. So I think on the ground, face-to-face, -face, masked organizing will be back um, in 2022 and will be a critical part of all of that. So those are some of the things I'm thinking about. It's off, obviously early in the game, but um, be prepared, but go in with gusto, I would say. 
And those are some good words for us to end. Uh, thank you so much for joining us for this installment at the Big Talks. And if you have any topic that you'd like to discuss, uh, please leave a comment below. In the meantime, have a wonderful day, everybody. Stay tuned for next episodes. Bye-bye.